May 40 here. So this Joe Biden cognitive decline story has left the realm of the temporal. It's left the realm of no ordinary news stories. It's entered the realm of the moral and the sacred. And you hear the main players discussed not primarily in terms of their self-interest, which is how normally political news is analyzed and covered. All right, uh, the Republicans have this interest, the Democrats have that interest. Now, anyone who's willing to come forward with damaging information about Joe Biden and his cognitive decline and how it's been covered up, right, that person is regarded as a patriot. Right? If people had done that prior to the disastrous debate June 27th, right, their, their motives would have been questioned. And why on earth is this Democrat leaking this information at this point against Joe Biden? And so the focus would be on motives. But now we I'm hearing a lot of analysis of the motives of the primary players, right? We, we've entered the realm of the sacred. So that's an example of how this story has taken on connotations of Watergate, right? Because Watergate was not primarily about the political players and their self-interested motivations, all right? Facts don't speak for themselves. They always need a context. They need a narrative and the context for this Joe Biden decline story is changed from that of the temporal to that of the eternal. All right. This story is no longer a partisan one. It's an American one. The health of the Republic is at risk. All right. We have a national security risk and the problem is an infection of lies emanating from the White House, just as in Watergate, where the problem was the lies emanating from the White House. So all sides of the American political spectrum are increasingly demanding that Joe Biden step down because he has broken his contract with America. He's exhibited bad faith. So bad faith refers to honesty or fraud. And it means dishonest belief or purpose, untrustworthy performance of duties, neglect of fair dealing standards, fraudulent intent. So now we're hearing about a Parkinson's specialist spending a great deal of time and making numerous visits to the White House. What the heck is going on? Was Joe Biden's cognitive decline diagnosed or undiagnosed? Either way, it's a heck of a story. So uh, Professor Jeffrey Alexander is a sociologist, I believe, at Yale, and he wrote in his 2003 book an essay, The Meaning of, of Social Life, A Cultural Sociology. So he talked about how Watergate just started out as a third-rate burglary, neither politically motivated nor seen as morally relevant. Then the Democrats took it up, said it was a major act of political espionage, a symbol of a demagogic and amoral Republican president. But Americans were not persuaded by this extreme reaction, and the incident received relatively little attention in 1972. It did not generate any widespread sense of outrage. Now, with Joe Biden, the majority of Democrats did not want him to run for a second term. So his run for a second term was an installation by the elites. So now the elite outrage of Joe Biden is following up on the disgust of the majority of Democrats for the past few years. So... In 1972, the news media played down the Watergate story, right? not because they were coerced, but because they genuinely felt it was a relatively unimportant event. So how did the perception of Watergate change? Right? So Watergate itself was relatively inconsequential, and it wasn't a new collection of facts that changed the perception of Watergate. But what happened is that we moved from the mundane level of goals, power, and interests to the realm of values. And that's also what we're seeing with this Joe Biden story. So values of truth, honesty, the, the republic. So profane politics means self-interested politics. But sacred politics, right, is the, the realm of uh, beautiful and the good and the true and the holy versus that which is dangerous and, and dark and bad for the republic. So we've now entered the, the realm of righteousness and there needs to be some sort of ritual by which the public can feel cleansed of the disgusting infectious nature of the lies that are threatening to pollute our republic coming from the biden white house all right there needs to be some sort of ritual and purification process so we can move from the structural the profane and the impure back to some kind of symbolic sacred pure center of society so we, we might get televised hearings asking when did Biden's aides know that he was infirm, frail, senile. When, when did they know it, right? And, and how did they help cover it up? And so the story is kind of moving, in a sense, out of, of time to a, a new 
realm. And so we have editing, repetition, juxtaposition, simplification, other techniques that allow this story to increasingly appear mythical. And so if we have televised hearings, we'll get the hushed voices of the announcers, the pomp and ceremony of the event. And so we will get a construction of a sacred time and a sacred space. And through TV, tens of millions of Americans might get to participate symbolically and emotionally in the deliberations of a Senate or, or House committee. And viewing might become seen as morally obligatory. Old routines might be broken, new ones formed. And we might get you know, ringing and unabashed affirmations of the universalist myths that are the backbone of American civic culture, that Americans should behave virtuously, nobody should be selfish or inhumane, no American should be so concerned with money or power that it blinds his commitment to fair play, no team loyalty should be so strong that it violates the common good or makes criticism toward authority unnecessary. We should uh, return to truth and justice as the basis of American political society. So let's get a quick burst here from Howard Kurtz from Fox. It was just one month ago that the Wall Street Journal was criticized and even denounced for a story headline behind closed doors, Biden shows signs of slipping. Quote, he read from notes to make obvious points, paused for extended periods, and sometimes closed his eyes for so long that some in the room wondered whether he had tuned out. And yet the piece was his widely points, attacked. For extended I am sort of actually embarrassed for the Wall Street Journal uh, with this piece. This piece is so tilted, so off the, off the mark. Is he 81 years old? Yes. In the wake of President Biden's disastrous debate and a growing media and Democratic revolt against his candidacy, co-author Annie Linsky says she was surprised at the chorus of condemnation. What we've seen in the last few days is the reporting that we did was was vindicated. We had a very high bar for uh, what we were willing to report and what my editors were willing to report. Where does the journal go to get its apology? And this cover of The Economist says it all. Now, other journalists are digging into Biden's mental fitness. The New York Times reporting that to White House officials, he increasingly appeared confused or listless or would lose the thread of conversations. There have been 15, 20 occasions in the last year and a half when the president has appeared somewhat as he did. So if you go to church or you go to synagogue or you go to mosque and the religious leader of your community stands up and speaks, all right, you don't get the sense that he's speaking out of his self-interest, right? And obviously he's just as self-interested as a plumber or someone in construction. But the setting, the rituals, the precedence, the tradition, the scene all set the stage for someone who is speaking for God, for speaking for tradition, speaking for the best interests of the community as a whole. And so the scene, the setting, the, the narrative, the precedence, right, they create how we respond to a message. So if your pastor, your rabbi, your imam stood up and spoke and you overwhelmingly saw his speech in terms of his own self-interest, that it's not so much he wants us to become holier and more ethical, he just wants to increase his power over our lives, then you would be very much breaking with the norm, all right? If you shared that perspective with your community, it would be highly unpopular. The only exception would be is if the community had come to see your religious leader as unfit for office. And then if people start talking about your leader's unfitness for office, that he's operating in his own self-interest, he just wants to aggrandize himself, he just wants to hold on to power, then your religious leader's you know, time in authority in your community is very short. And that's how Joe Biden is being seen now, as just hanging on in delusion, right? Just grasping on to power. In that horror show uh, that we witnessed. With Biden betting on an interview with George Stephanopoulos, some media liberals are saying he should just resign and hand the presidency to Kamala Harris. Five Democratic members of Congress so far have publicly called for the president to step aside. And The Times, in a report that a White House spokesman called absolutely false, says Biden told a key ally that he knows he may not be able to stay in the race unless he can change public opinion in the coming days. The overriding media question now, can he weather this storm? I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz.
Okay, so we're moving into something that's uh, unprecedented. We, we've never had a story just like this. Gosh, I'm, I'm invoking cliches, but it, it's hard to, hard to think of, of something that's uh, similar to this. And the, the number one difference between liberal and conservative news media over the past five years has been that the conservative news media has consistently regarded Joe Biden as senile and obviously unfit for office, obviously cognitively not there. And the liberal news media, overwhelmingly, with a few exceptions, has derided this conservative fixation and said it is based on cheap fakes, it's uh, based on partisanship, it's not based in reality. And on the biggest divide... In the news in the United States over the past five years, the conservative news media has proved to be correct, right? You would get more wisdom on this story, right, from your 115 IQ right-wing talk show host. (laughs) You got more wisdom on this story from Sean Hannity at Fox News than you did, by and large, from the high IQ liberal elite media. So why were 100 IQ conservative plumbers able to spot Joe Biden's obvious cognitive decline and 140 IQ political and media elites not able to see it. And I think it primarily comes down to liberal speech codes. So there's a refrain among liberal members of the news media that uh, covering the president's age was a very sensitive issue. They were reluctant to do it because they did not want to be accused of ageism and ableism. Now, that's almost unfathomable to me because to me there are no such moral categories as ableism and ageism, particularly with regard to President of the United States. If there's any evidence that he is not fit for office, that uh, he is not cognitively there, then that's a, an obvious news story. Now, I don't normally think in terms of fit for office because it just strikes me as a overwhelmingly a propaganda term because I don't have an elevated perception of political office, right? It, it, to me, it's just one more human expression of the desire to thrust for power. Uh, some people turn to preaching. Some people turn to live streaming. Other people turn to taking care of their kids, right? There's a human impulse to elevate ourselves in social status. And I just take that for granted. And so I don't expect any moral or or cognitive test for for political office. And I I wouldn't take it seriously when liberals talked about uh, Donald Trump being unfit for office because it struck me then, and it strikes me now, as fit for office is usually liberal propaganda speak, code speak for we need less politicization and more professionalization and more expertise. So determining whether or not someone's fit for office is usually a liberal concern, and the standard is, does the person meet up to the hero standards of liberalism? Will they pass tests by professionals, by the elite? So what common sense is to conservatives, right, belief in expertise and science and expert consensus is to liberals, and so this idea of fit for office is overwhelmingly a liberal concern, but now it's such a dominant part of our narrative, it's kind of hard to think about the Joe Biden story without that accompanying fit for office. Now, I'm not at all outraged by Joy Reid saying that she would vote for Joe Biden in a coma over any Republican candidate, because I think if most people are honest in their political preferences, right, if you identify as a Republican, you will vote for a Republican, even if they're in a coma over a Democrat. And if you identify as a Democrat, you will, of course, you'll vote for a Democrat in a coma over a Republican. So uh, I see politics as an expression of the evolutionary struggle for survival. I, I don't think in terms of, of uh, fit for office, but now this story has, has elevated itself from humdrum concerns of uh, clashing conflicts of interest to, to the realm of the, the sacred and the holy. It's, it's a you know, whole, whole, new, whole new world are mostly downbeat, with James Carville citing a CBS post-debate poll. We have a country that 72% wants something different. 
If the Democratic Party can't produce something different that 72 percent of people want, then why do we exist? Yeah. What are we here for? That's key, because initially I thought, oh, this is an elite driven story. Because there hasn't been a change in grassroots attitudes initially, but the, the grassroots of the Democratic Party have made it clear for years that they do not want Joe Biden to run for a second term. So initially I thought, oh, this is an elite driven story. Then I recognized, oh, the elites just catching up to the public sentiment. And now the elites catching up to the public sentiment that has filtered back to the grassroots so that when congressmen all right, talk to their constituents, all people want to talk about is Joe Biden's fitness for office. I mean, the country is clamoring for change. I do not think he's going to be their nominee. I don't know that he makes it to the end of his term. He needs to do everything he can to reverse the impression, the clear impression that was that was left by that debate. If there is concern that the president doesn't have the acuity to handle an hour or an hour and a half of, of questions, I, I don't understand the delay. Why not just have a press conference right now? In that exclusive interview with ABC News anchor George Stephanopoulos, Biden was on the defensive, saying he wouldn't drop out unless the Lord Almighty told him to. Do you dispute that there have been more lapses, especially in the last several months? Can I run the 110 flat? No, but I'm still in good shape. Are you more frail? No. Do you have the mental and physical capacity to do it for another four years? I believe so. I wouldn't be running if I didn't think I did. Look, Mr. President, I've never seen a president at 36 percent approval get reelected. Well, I don't believe that's my approval. Right? That's not what our polls show. So uh, the the interviewer there, George Stephanopoulos, should have followed up with, OK, which polls show what? All right. What's the basis for your assertion? So when Joe Biden talked about he needs to be reelected so he can continue on with this Middle East peace plan. Uh, what basis, Mr. President, is your Middle East peace plan effective? The Middle East seems like an absolute mess. All right, we seem on the verge of a major conflagration right now. Why on earth? What's your basis for believing that uh, your your Middle East uh, peace plan is particularly effective? So one sign of a story moving from the humdrum to the sacred is the story becomes increasingly covered in moral terms. And so we see liberal columnist Jonathan Chait writing for New York Magazine today, the problems are ethical, not just political, with the Biden team. Joe Biden has not broken any laws, but he has violated two important norms. First, he brought his crack addict son Hunter in to serve as an advisor in the White House, right? So Biden's aides are raising concerns, like what on earth is Hunter Biden doing in our key meetings? Right, what the hell is happening? Like, why did Joe Biden turn to his crack addict son as the primary person to prepare him for the George Stephanopoulos interview? And then the second and more severe violation of norms that Joe Biden is engaged in is he's ignoring the need to examine his cognitive health. Right? He has continually dismissed the need for a cognitive exam. So many different angles to this story. Uh, but perhaps uh, one that is particularly juicy to discuss uh, as a conservative, all right? I'm on the right. I, I strive at, at times to rise above my partisanship, but one particular juicy story is the media conspiracy to hide Joe Biden's cognitive condition as long as the news media thought he was the Democrats' best option for taking down Donald Trump. And then after the debate, when it, when it became clear that <laughs> Joe Biden was not the Democrats' best option for taking down Donald Trump, that he was going to lose to Donald Trump, that the absolute fury that the news media has exhibited, their, their relentlessness in going after Joe Biden, now that it's clear that he cannot defeat uh, Donald Trump. So they've completely switched. Now, if I stood up here and cited a bunch of conservative commentators saying that there's been a media conspiracy to hide, Donald, uh, to hide Joe Biden's cognitive decline, that wouldn't have any wider resonance outside, resonance outside of the right wing, what you need are people who are nonpartisan saying the same thing. And you increasingly do hear this from members of the conventional mainstream news media. Right? Mark Halperin, the best political reporter and commentator we have today, said explicitly yesterday that the news media has engaged in a conspiracy 
to hide Joe Biden's cognitive decline from the American public. Axios published yesterday that the, the news media has been deliberately hiding Joe Biden's cognitive decline from the American people. Right. So the conventional mainstream media is increasingly accepting that, yeah, uh, our profession has hidden Joe Biden's cognitive decline from the American public for partisan reasons. So between uh, 2016 and 2019, the number one news story in the United States was that uh, Donald Trump's team had cooperated with Russia and Vladimir Putin to manipulate the American elections. And then the Mueller report came out and showed that there was insufficient evidence for that allegation. So that was the number one story for three years, all right? There was a consistent difference in the way that uh, the conservative news media covered that story and the liberal news media covered that story, and the conservatives were right. Then we had the death of George Floyd and the summer of George and Black Lives Matter and a rapid increase in crime. We had the Ferguson effect back in 2014 due to Black Lives Matter. And again, the conservative media was much more accurate that the Ferguson effect, the George Floyd effect, led to an explosion in unnecessary deaths due to a dramatic increase in violent crime in this country with also repercussions for uh, reckless driving and driving deaths and pedestrian deaths and now also a remarkable increase in deaths by suicide in the black community in, in particular. So the conservative news media was far superior to the liberal news media in covering that story. On the other hand, conservatism has developed an increasing distrust of expertise as more and more experts are in the realm of uh, liberal politics. So conservatives used to have the same respect for science and expertise as liberals just 20 years ago. Now that's completely changed. Conservatives have this knee-jerk distrust of expertise, and they've been shown, I think, by COVID to frequently be wrong. So many conservative right-wing talk show hosts refused to get vaccinated and then died from COVID. So, you know, my opinion that uh, liberals on the left generally had a more responsible attitude towards containing COVID because they were less constrained by the knee-jerk conservative opposition to deference to expertise and the knee-jerk conservative opposition to removing rights and the knee-jerk conservative opposition to big government. So controlling something like the coronavirus provides a basis for the temporary taking away of rights. And many conservative commentators said, oh, this is just part of a big government push by, by Democrats and we're going to lose these rights forever. And that just did not turn out to be true, right? The rights to freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, freedom of uh, participating in your religion at a church or a synagogue, they were returned shortly after widespread vaccination. So conservatives were wrong on many things with regard to COVID. So it's not like I, I think that conservatives don't have their blind spots. Like every individual has their blind spots, right? Everything that we hold sacred then becomes a blind spot for us. Uh, conservatives have their blind spots. Jews have their blind spots. Christians have their blind spots. Young people have their blind spots. For example, up until the late 20s, right, most people have a vastly exaggerated sense of their own capability. So young people have their blind spots, old people have their blind spots, we all have their blind spots, but what we don't get in conventional discourse is pointing out uh, typical blind spots by Jewish intellectuals, typical blind spots by conservative Christian intellectuals, typical blind spots of the young or the old or of uh, blacks or, or gays or uh, evangelical Christians, all right? All groups have their blind spots. Let's just uh, play a little bit more here from how it cuts. Problem, polls are wrong, it was just one bad night. Well, that interview, you really didn't see him acting much different than you've seen him act for many months now, many years now. So it, you can describe it now as halting and low energy, but this is what Americans have been seeing for a long time. And a lot of even Democrat voters have felt this way about Biden, and yet they nominated him to be their candidate. And so this Stephanopoulos interview looks more like a Democrat operative, and he is one, trying to implore a fellow political ally to get out of the race for the good of the Democrat Party. Well, Stephanopoulos hasn't been, uh, at least officially, uh, since the days of the Clinton White House, a Democratic operative. But Richard, David Axelrod, who, of course, worked for Obama, uh, called the interview uh, showing... ...about that. I mean, the vast majority...
So Molly Hemingway wrote a book on the 2020 election, and to the extent that Republicans and conservatives can make a case that uh, the election was rigged, she has done the best job. Now, I, I wasn't convinced. Uh, I thought there were many shortcomings to her book, but she still did the best job of any conservative about uh, changes in voting laws in the 2020 election that uh, may have not created a level playing field. The majority of Americans have, with their own eyes and ears, witnessed the decline of this president. Mm -hmm. It was a major talking point in 2020. We're talking about a White House press corps that had no problem running wild with accusations and un un anonymous sources and conspiracy theories when it was a Republican, Donald Trump. But now we're supposed to believe that they were somehow duped, that the rest of the country could see something that they couldn't see. I don't buy it. I don't think any Americans buy it. The level of media corruption that we're seeing is complete at this point. They didn't cover the story because they thought it would be bad for Democrats to talk about the senility of the president. And now they're covering it because they, they've they lost confidence in their ability to drag Joe Biden across the finish line. There's nothing honest about this, and they don't get any points whether they... All right, so they thought that Joe Biden was their best bet to defeat Donald Trump in the fall. And after the debate, they saw that he was not going to defeat Donald Trump. Start covering it now or not. Uh, as we look at live pictures of the president at a black church in North Philadelphia, Mount Airy, uh, I guess I would just say that. So it's just a so bad. So interesting uh, commentary from the former president with Kamala Harris trailing Trump in one poll by only two points. Better than Biden. There's sort of a new buzz about her, especially with Jim Clyburn saying if Biden doesn't run, he will back the vice president. Uh, what do you make of all that? I think it's worth noting that all of this desire to oust Biden is happening only among the media and other top Democrats. Mm -hmm. You are not seeing a groundswell calling for change from Democrat voters. Again, they just had a primary election. Mm -hmm. You just are seeing this, right? The, the primary election was rigged, right? In 2016, the primary election was rigged to make Hillary Clinton the Democratic nominee. So she got answers to questions from CNN unlike all the other candidates. So the primary elections for candidate for, for president in the Democratic Party have been largely rigged. They just overwhelmingly chose this man to be their nominee. And now there is growing uh, grassroots opposition to Joe Biden running as a Democratic nominee. nominee. And now the media are acting like there's, like basically that that doesn't matter. They don't feel confident in Biden. They want to replace him. And you have a media who are claiming that they were lied to because they think it would be better. They, like they're willing to, they're willing to look stupid. So one of the major themes of this show is the importance of situation. And this is a great test whether this theory that I had that I took from John M. Doris about how the situation is usually more is often more important than any other factor for determining what's going on, right? This is a great test whether you can take this theory and, and apply it to worlds where you don't know nearly as much as the experts. So the dominant perspective of political experts all, all last week was that Joe Biden cannot be replaced as nominee for the Democratic Party. I don't know as much as the political experts, but armed with this theory of the importance of situation, and it's the situation that determines the relative importance of competing values, right? I saw the situation was so dire that uh, Joe Biden will be forced to drop out. So perhaps this theory is more valuable than expertise in many different areas. Also, due to the dire nature of Kamala Harris being unpopular and not demonstrating the ability to think on her feet, to be verbally fluent, to respond well under pressure. I also suspect, opposed to all the, almost all the political experts, that there will be akin to an open primary for the Democratic nomination. So will this construct of the situation win out over expertise? Because from the perspective of expertise, the, the idea of an open nomination now to be the Democratic nominee for president seems absolutely outlandish. So on the basis of precedent, on the basis of law, on the basis of expertise, right? The idea that we're going to have an open primary for the Democratic nominee for, for president is unfathomable and outlandish from the construct of the situation determines what's the most important factor, right? That 
open primary seems like the most likely choice. So, yeah, I think there's going to be an open primary for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. And obviously, I know less than political elites, but sometimes if you've got a powerful enough construct, right, you can see reality more clearly than the experts. On the other hand, a construct, a conception of reality can blind you. So the United States conception of reality prior to Pearl Harbor was that the Japanese would not attack. And because this conception was inadequate, right, the United States was devastated in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Similarly, the Israelis had a conception that their enemies would not attack on Yom Kippur 1973. Their conception proved to be inadequate and Israel's enemies made substantial gains in the first two days of that war. Similarly, with regard to October 7, 2023, Israel's defense and intelligence establishment had a construct that uh, Hamas wanted peace and was not a major threat to southern Israel. The construct was wrong, right? All this information was coming in that uh, Hamas was planning a major attack and the people in charge of Israel's military defense and intelligence were blinded to that information by their incorrect concept of reality and so israel was inept and largely defenseless when hamas you know overran its its virtual wall so sometimes a conception can give you great clarity and put you ahead of the experts in detecting what's going on and other time no matter how much you know no matter how much expertise you have right your concept can blind you to reality and you have to be stupid to have not seen this story coming for five years or they're saying that they were lied to and they're so bad at their jobs they can't figure out how to deal with liars. And both of those things mean that it's the media who should actually resign before Joe Biden or anyone else. Right. They have Wait, shown does that themselves. Mean every single journalist I would in every say news organization? Probably the White House press corps should resign in mass unless they can show that they aggressively targeted this story for the last five years. Then they should, yes, absolutely. Uh, Gretchen Whitmer denied a report that she told the White House that Biden uh, was not, would not win Michigan. She said it was full of S. Um, no way, to, if Biden doesn't run or is pushed out, whatever, no way to bypass Kamala Harris without a fierce blowback? Uh, listen, I definitely think Kamala Harris would be the problem, but I do think Molly problem with both parties are guilty and we should be looking at his policies. They don't like inflation. They don't like what he's doing with foreign policy. They don't like domestic policy. And you have not heard the media. So the news media has not wanted to focus on the issues on, on policy because most of them cut against the Biden administration, right? There are a few areas where the Biden team is more popular than the Republican approach, such as with regard to taxing the rich and with support for abortion rights. But on most policy issues, the Republican platform is more popular. Media talking about the actual reason why Americans don't like Joe Biden. Instead, they're just doing all this about his health. Well, but yeah, the, but the the hold hold on. Donald Trump. But the race was like tied. I, I want to get to this. Uh, two black radio hosts have confirmed that the Biden campaign gave them questions in advance. I mean, how much lacking in integrity are these radio hosts to simply repeat the questions that are given to them by the <laughs> Biden White House? And they each use four of them. And even then, he stumbled at times. Does that suggest that his own people don't trust the president to do routine interviews? So again, this is something that the White House has been doing for years. No. If you follow non-leftist media, you have known this story for years. Well, you have I, seen I don't the questions that, supplied. That this... That's true. She's absolutely right. This was the most dramatic divide between conservative media and liberal news media. Right? Overwhelmingly on the conservative side, its leading commentators have have pointed out that Joe Biden is cognitively not up to the task of president of the United States. It, it, it's an outrageous uh, journalistic breach. So when it was when it was caught on tape on video before that he was he was being handled questions and he knew exactly who was going to ask. Which so Molly Hemingway is a conservative partisan, but her arguments here are being increasingly echoed by mainstream prestigious journalists such as the men running Axios including Alex Thompson, Mike Allen, Jim Vandehey. Which question? CNN said this was a mark of him being well-prepared. Now they claim that this is some huge... Right. The New York Times, shortly before the debate, ran a column saying that uh, Joe Biden was like, oh, Beethoven, right? Just, just getting better with age.
scandal when they were covering it for a year, you know, for years, just a few years ago. The, the only thing that has changed is that the media went from covering this up because they thought it hurt Democrats to now making a big deal about it because they're. So Molly Hemingway strikes me as the most compelling near daily conservative commentator on TV. Who, who's better than Molly Hemingway? They're worried that Joe Biden can't win. Everything can be understood through the prism of does this help or hurt the Democrat Party? That's the only consistency in our media. Well, one, well I'm not sure. That is a damaging charge, and this story makes it look like uh, she's right. But no, I mean, that no military had died under his watch. Yes, that was a mistake. Not, that was a misstatement. It was false. He, there were, Trump there also, were, there Trump were also said that he has the highest rating in the VA, and that's not even a thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> All right. And then he said black jobs. We but, can go but, about that. But that's claiming not a thing, that I don't know what a black job the person is. You don't like. There, there are characteristics of uh, black jobs and Ashkenazi jobs. For example, uh, Ashkenazi Jews normally don't serve in the military in the United States. They normally don't do manual labor jobs. Right. So a far higher percentage of African-Americans work in manual labor or janitorial or low-paying jobs compared to Ashkenazi Jews or compared to Northeast Asian citizens of the United States. So there are jobs that are distinguished by the differing percentages in, engaged in that occupation. So security guards seems to be overwhelmingly, at least in California, right, a, a black or a Hispanic job, right, janitorial tends to be increasingly Hispanic job in California. Cons lower level construction jobs seem to be increasingly Hispanic jobs. They used to, domestic labor used to be primarily a, a black job in the United States of America. Now it's increasingly a job held by Hispanics. Joining us now from Florida, Ben Shapiro, co-founder of The Daily Wire, host of The Ben Shapiro Show, and a number one New York Times best-selling author. Ben, you write in The Spectator that the mainstream media, trust in the mainstream media, has been fractured beyond repair. And obviously that's been building for years. Why do you think we've reached the breaking point now? I think that in all other cases where the media have deceived the American public on everything from their over coverage of, of Russia Gate to their coverage of COVID to Black Lives Matter, there's at least been this level of plausible deniability where they could still make the case that there were studies supporting what they were saying or that there were experts who suggested the opposite. What happened during the debate with Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump is that a case they'd been making about Joe Biden for years, which is that he was mentally and physically sound or at least sound enough to be president of the United States, was exploded just in public, and everybody saw it, and there's no way to deny it. And it was also perfectly obvious that the press had to have known that, because obviously people who are in the general public were noting Joe Biden's pretty obvious decline over the course of the past couple of years. And so when the media came out with this extraordinary outrage, this shock and surprise at Joe Biden's status, I think the American... So this story is just one of many that emphasizes a dramatic gap between what your eyes see and what the arbiters of truth tell you it is true. So the arbiters of truth occupy the high ground in our culture. They're, they're the people who dominantly run most of our institutions. They dominantly have a liberal left worldview. So your eyes see that different groups commit different amounts of crime, right? There are different proportions of those who commit violent crime. It doesn't just break down, for example, to the demographics of the population. And so your eyes tell you that different groups have different gifts. But this is something that is socially unacceptable to say. Your eyes tell you that men and women have different gifts. Uh, your eyes tell you that the game is sometimes you know, rigged against men, such as sexual harassment laws. So women can wear highly provocative clothing to the office, but if the man comments on it, the man's the one who gets into trouble. So differences between men and women differences between racial, ethnic, uh, religious groups, right, uh, proclivities towards uh, violent crime or to cheating on taxes, right, tend to differ between groups. And uh, there, there are all these obvious discrepancies between what your own eyes tell you and what the arbiters of truth tell you. And so this creates, particularly on the right, increasing distrust of our institutions and distrust of expertise and distrust of science and distrust of the news media.
American public and the public generally looked at that and said, wait, you're not shocked by this at all. You're the ones in the room with him. You're on the plane with him. You're at all of his campaign events. You see him behind the scenes. And not surprisingly, we've seen a spate of stories over the past two weeks that have basically said what we all knew, which is that they knew for months, they knew for years that he was in a state of severe decline. Olivia Nuzzi's piece from New York Magazine being the most obvious case of this. But now, you know, again, when when people see this thing, you can't unsee the fact that there were people who knew about this for two years and kind of covered it up, and then it exploded, and there's no denying it this time in the way that there was about any of these prior sort of fibs that the media had been telling. Well, with the possible exception of the White House press corps, I mean, his inner circle kept him increasingly away from the press, which I criticized all the time. Uh, I've covered him for 35 years. I probably know him better than anybody at Fox. And I only saw the deterioration and confusion that everybody saw when watching on TV. In other words, it isn't like journalists got to hang out with the president. He was kept in a bubble. So Mark Halperin saw clearly Joe Biden's cognitive vacant state back in 2018. And conservatives generally saw Joe Biden's checked out cognitive state certainly by 2020. Cool. I mean, that's true, but with the exception of the White House press corps is a pretty solid exception. There, there are a lot of people in the White House press okay. corps. And it turns out that Joe Biden was going to events and behind the scenes, he was meeting reporters at these events sort of in passing, and they could see that he was sort of glassy eyed and slack jawed, that he wasn't all there. This was perfectly obvious in bits and pieces ever. And not only that, there was an overt attempt by members of the media to proclaim that any focus on this was somehow out of bounds. I mean, the cheap fakes scandal was three weeks ago. Hey, that was not five months ago. That was not two years ago. That was three weeks ago when the White House was trotting out this line that all of these videos were cut out of context and that actually the president was doing just fine. And then as soon as the debate ended, the New York Times put out a piece citing exactly the same videos as evidence that Joe Biden had been in a state of decline for weeks, months, if not years. And so, again, the, the, the sort of shock that we're seeing right now feels like Captain Raynaud in Casablanca, that they're shocked, shocked to find there's gambling been going on here. Like, well, you're not, not really shocked. I think that what the media have been shocked by is the fact that Joe Biden's campaign was in Competent enough to put this on full display. That's the part that I think shocked everybody. Yeah, well, one of those. This... So, the most important reporting being done on this story comes from Axios, particularly Alex Thompson. But uh, the two blokes who run Axios are Mike Allen and Jim Vanderhey. They have a long, prestigious track record in American journalism. They're centrist to center left, and uh, the savviest uh, political followers are just constantly refreshing on Axios. And so the most important reporting is consistently coming from Axios, including today. And they note we're in uncharted historic borders. We've got uh, President Biden and the Biden family saying that nothing except an act of God will persuade Joe Biden to quit his reelection campaign. But outside of Joe Biden's family, you've got a fast growing number of Democrats who are praying for and plotting a more earthly intervention, right? They want everyone from the Obamas to congressional leaders to beg Joe Biden to drop out by this Friday, right? This is the consensus among the Democratic elites, right? And, and both sides seem to be 100% committed to their position. So both plan fierce public and private campaigns to see who buckles, right? So Democratic lawmakers have gone from shock last Thursday night, to sadness, to madness, right? They're absolutely infuriated by the Biden White House, and they were deflated by Joe Biden's ABC interview. They believe there's absolutely nothing that Joe Biden can do. So can the Biden family maintain their narrative in the face of nearly universal opposition, right? It's really hard to maintain your narrative if nobody else uh, supports you, right? Every single person not named Biden, not paid by the president, recognizes how deep of a hole he is in. Right? David Axelrod posted an opinion piece Saturday, denial, delusion, defiance. We have other members of the elite news media, Dan Bowles of the Washington Post, talking about how Joe Biden is operating in denial. We're learning that uh, major donors are quitting the party. Right? Uh, and now... Big donors and key constituents are giving grave concern about Joe Biden's mental acuity. The story is breaking through into normal America. Uh, one swing state lawmaker says that uh, monthly forum back home is usually consumed by community issues. Now all anyone wants to talk about is Joe Biden's age. Right? Dozens of House members and senators 
are very close to speaking out publicly or signing letters demanding that uh, Joe Biden sit down. All right, this afternoon, House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries will hold a Zoom call with ranking members of committees of the House of Representatives. Uh, there's thinking that uh, Speaker Emeritus Nancy Pelosi might have the stature to tell Joe Biden that it's over. Top Democrats hope Biden leaves by Friday because the rush of events will soon soak up whatever attention Americans will give the news as the summer wanes. Right? If Biden were to endorse Kamala Harris, she'd need time to ramp up and pick a running mate. If Joe Biden doesn't anoint, there will be an absolute frenzy among governors and ambitious Democrats to try to win the nomination at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Every day that goes by that Joe Biden does not agree to step down is a disaster for the Democratic Party. All right, something's got to give. Let's hear a little bit more here from uh, Howard Kurtz and Ben Shapiro. This is the... Sorry, I was just going to say, I didn't mean to interrupt you, one of those videos with Obama leading uh, his former vice president off the stage was not touched in any way. But let me turn to this. How much did the rise of Donald Trump, the overwhelmingly negative coverage of Trump, which seems only to help him, and his attacks on the media as enemy of people contribute to this plummeting decline in trust? Well, I mean, if you look at the statistics, the actual plummeting decline in trust began during the Obama era, not during the Trump era. So I've said many times that a lot of people are, are you know, very angry at Donald Trump about his impact on American politics. They suggest that he's the person who did sort of the chief damage to the media. But that's obviously untrue by the polling data. If you look at the Gallup trust polls in the mainstream media, that's been declining since early on in the Obama era. And it really has. And uh, Elliot Blatt says, uh, go with your gut. You want to understand the world? Go with your gut. All right. Intellectualism is for the gloopy ones. Well, sometimes your gut is right and sometimes it's wrong. There, there are some situations where you should go with the expert consensus and the other times you should side with the wisdom of the people. Right. So it depends on the situation. Never recovered. It went from about 50 percent at the beginning of Obama's term down to about 32 percent prior to even this last couple of weeks. Right. And but you had a president because... who was constantly attacking the media, which he had every right to do. And it was a sort of part of the running theme of, uh, of that presidency. And th but that was nothing new. I mean, if you recall back during the 2012 primaries, Newt Gingrich, to, round, to loud rounds of applause from people like me, was attacking the press specifically because during the Obama era, there was a reorientation of the press away from the idea that they were to hold truth to power and toward the idea that Barack Obama was a great light bringer who was to be sort of massaged into acceptability by the press at every available turn. And because of that, there was this widespread perception that the media had become a Praetorian guard for Barack Obama, that they weren't even before that for, for other Democrats. And I think that, that Trump is a reaction to that. Trump, as I've said many times, is sort of the coroner of American politics, not the murderer himself. <laughs> now, um, but the media at times have been sharply critical of the Biden presidency, the deadly withdrawal from Afghanistan, presiding over an open border that took many months to uh, gain traction. So it's not like it's all one sided and it's not like you were supporting him before. No, I think that what you saw in some of these cases, the border in particular, was sort of people arriving late on the scene. So the media, for the first few months, basically denied anything was happening at the border, downplayed it. And mm -hmm. then, of course, as it became undeniable, then you have to cover it. And I think that's one of the things you're seeing. So philosophically, the most interesting part of this story for me is how liberal speech codes and the valorization of moral categories such as ableism and ageism blinded liberals to reality while conservatives who did not share the liberal hero system, it was just obvious to them that Joe Biden was senile. So Jim Vanderhey, Mike Allen write for Axios yesterday, it is a fair conservative critique that many reporters ignored obvious signs of cognitive decline. There were many early signs. Biden rarely did tough interviews. It was almost always friendly questions on friendly terrain. And the denials from the Biden administration that he's in cognitive decline strain credibility and look ludicrous right, in, in retrospect. So liberals were blinded, fascinating, by their own speech code. And, and part of this uh, speech code is that you're not allowed to say that, that someone's senile. That automatically places you in the category of a bad person, a barbarian, uh, not part of the elite, not part of the anointed. You're outside of polite society if you say that uh, Joe Biden is senile. But is that not the first word that rises to your lips? Is it much more natural to say Joe Biden is senile than to say Joe Biden is experiencing cognitive decline? 
isn't it more natural and healthy and realistic to say homeless, right, rather than people who are experiencing homelessness? Isn't it more natural to say illegal alien rather than undocumented alien, someone who's just forgotten their, their documents or uh, someone who's in the country illegally, right? You normally naturally would say illegal alien. So because uh, conservatives don't have this liberal restriction on vocabulary, there are vast parts of reality that conservatives have a much easier time being frank and, and realistic about, right? Liberals want to stigmatize frank and easy discussion of uh, group differences, that uh, different ages have different gifts, that different sexes have different gifts, that different races and ethnicities and religions tend to have different gifts. So back in January 6, 2022, Edward Luce wrote for the Financial Times, and the Financial Times, about the most prestigious English language publication in the world today, probably either exceeding, matching, or just below the New York Times. And so January 6, 2022, he wrote, on no topic is the bifurcation of America's media more evident than that of the president's age. To the conservative media world, right, Joe Biden's imagined senility is a staple. Republican figures routinely call for him to take cognitive tests. The term dementia is bandied about. By contrast, the closest traditional outlets have come to addressing Joe Biden's age as an issue as a spate of reports since the low ratings of his Vice President Kamala Harris. So for the Liberals, it is as if openly acknowledging Biden's advancing years will validate the right-wing conspiracy mongers. Well, it turns out the right-wing conspiracy mongers were right. ...right now is now Biden's decline is undeniable, and so the media now have to cover it because it's totally undeniable. That shouldn't be the job of the media. The media should be first on the scene, not last on the scene. It shouldn't be some rando Twitter account that's covering the news. And six months later, the media are like, hey, by the way, that rando Twitter account, turns out he was right. It should be the media. They're the ones with the most access, of course. All right. Uh, just briefly, Ben, can the media rehabilitate themselves and avoid what you call in the piece the ash can of history? I think it's going to be very, very difficult for them to do so. You know, maybe they can do that if somebody except for Biden appears for the rest of the race. Let's say that Kamala Harris becomes the new nominee and Biden steps back. They would actually. Have yeah, of course, they can re rehabilitate themselves because everyone's got blind spots. Right. Conservative intellectuals and pundits did terribly with regard to covid compared to their liberal elite peers. Every, every group's got blind spots, right? Every individual's got blind spots. Of course, they can rehabilitate themselves, but rehabilitate themselves with regard to whom? Right? It, it's not as though the news media is going to receive universal acclaim, no matter what it does, right? The, the news media's reputation will vary depending on the demographics, right? Conservatives will have suspicion of the news media and of science and of expertise as long as these categories are dominated by people on the left. They have to cover Kamala Harris critically, which is something they're going to have a tough time doing given the fact that so many members of the media overtly would support Kamala Harris in the face of a new Donald Trump presidency. Okay, uh, I understand the challenge. I'm certainly... Uh... Wouldn't argue that the, the trust has declined for many years. I think there are many reasons, but it's great to have your point of view. Ben Shapiro, thanks very much for joining us this Sunday. Thanks for having me. Up next, why Corinne Jean-Pierre is grappling with a very angry press room. Real Estate Professionals Trust. Come on, I'm trying to run a show here. The White House briefing erupted with outrage. So why is the news media so angry? Because they're humiliated, right? That is why you've got this intensity of reaction because the news media doesn't like being exposed and humiliated just as like virologists would be humiliated if it turned out that the origins of coronavirus was a lab leak, right? The whole profession would drop in esteem. And now the whole profession of journalists, all right, political journalists is dramatically dropping in prestige because it, it looks as though the... White House press corps in particular, has engaged in a massive cover-up, something that has put the safety of the republic at risk because they, they've covered up the declining and obvious nature of Joe Biden's senility. Each questions for Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre after the president's abysmal debate performance. Is anyone in the White House hiding information about the president's health or his ability to do the job day to day? Absolutely not. Pelosi said it's a legitimate question to ask. If this is an episode or is this is a condition, which one is it? Well, what I can tell you is that um, he 
had a cold and a bad night. Uh, I would not see this as an episode. Are you being straight with the American people? So are you saying uh, that the majority of Americans are misguided and that they just need to trust Dr. O'Connor and take him at his word? I have have engagement with the president pretty regularly. Uh, what I see is a strong, resolute president who's always w willing and, and able to work on behalf of the American people. Joining us now from outside Philadelphia, Jackie Heinrich, senior White House correspondent for Fox News. Jackie, there was much more of that. Why do the reporters in that briefing room sound so angry and aggressive in their grilling of Karine Jean-Pierre? Well, Howie, I think that, you know, there's this broad feeling that we have not been allowed to access to the president for so long. And there are a lot of reasons, I think, why that strategy has happened. I don't necessarily think it's because he has been secretly behind closed doors deteriorating for longer than we all know. I think that there's a, a bigger and maybe even more concerning layer there, uh, which is that they have, as an, an administration, calculated that they don't need us and it doesn't benefit them to talk to us. They can go to a certain you know, zip code where they need to reach a few thousand supporters and go to a friendly podcast host there and get their message out and really sort of just give us handout video, which is why we as a press corps are always trying to advocate for more access. But when the Band-Aid is ripped off, you see him you know, for 90 minutes and all of the sort of arm's length comes spilling out into full view, people are concerned about you know, why haven't we been able to get our eyes on him up until now. Right, always, right. And my own view is that I think many of them felt misled and even lied to. But yeah. this raises a point because uh, in, earlier in the program, uh, some of the critics of the president have said, you know, the White House press corps did a horrible job because you all knew this. When you're on the road, how much do you actually get to see the president? Not at all. Um, you know, we, we what we see, you see. We see him from, you know, the underwing of Air Force One as he's going up the stairs. He might come over and gaggle with us here and there. We might get a question shouted to him on the South Lawn as he's going to Marine One. He might answer a question leaving the East Room after he gives, you know, prepared remarks from a teleprompter. But I also think the reason why they do that is that this administration, the people who run it, don't like when the president speaks off the cuff. You recall when he at the State of the Union mentioned Lake and Riley's name for the first time and he said that he she was killed by an illegal, right? And then he gets the question at the underwing of Air Force One, do you regret using that term? And his answer was no, technically he's not supposed to be here. And then fast forward a couple days and he's having an interview with MSNBC saying, actually, I should have said undocumented. That's because when the president speaks off the cuff, yeah. the answer that he gives don't satisfy big parts of the base they're trying to keep in line. So this is a very highly choreographed administration. So obviously referring to someone who, who is in the country illegally as undocumented is a euphemism, right? What, what documents are they missing? They're in the country illegally. It's like uh, saying that uh, stealing from stores is just undocumented shopping. So when you use euphemisms for reality, all right, it affects your thinking because we think in terms of words. And when you adopt these restrictive speech codes, you will think less and less clearly. That which you're not allowed to say out loud, you will increasingly not even think to yourself. And that's why everyone's got their blind spots because everyone's got something that is sacred. And when you've got something that is sacred, right, you're not able to think clearly on that matter. And that's why we all think more clearly socially when we share what we think and then hear what other people think and we can have our blind spots you know brought to our attention and we can recognize you know flaws in in our own uh, perspective administration and there's a lot of reasons why they haven't led us close to him right you uh, had an exchange with queen jean pierre that uh, got a fair amount of attention let's take a look how is it that the president was still tired 12 days after returning from europe uh, had a cold, but then went to the Waffle House. And then the f following day staged such a huge comeback that he gave those North Carolina remarks. Like, help us understand. Have you had a cold before? Of course I've had a okay. cold before. Okay, so you probably, well, well, come on. What was your reaction to that? And also that she keeps sticking to the talking point that, oh, behind the scenes, the president is very cogent and energetic. Well, the timeline just absolutely doesn't make sense. He'd been in the U.S. recovering for 12 days from his two foreign trips. He was at Camp David doing six days of intensive debate prep with 16 advisors all around him. And then all of a sudden, you know, goes to the Waffle House, 
and while he's sick and then stages this recovery and gives these amazing remarks to North. So Jackie Heinrich was the recipient of Tucker Carlson's wrath. So when she would report after the 2020 election in November that there wasn't any evidence to support Donald Trump's claims of uh, massive voter fraud, right? Tucker Carlson sent these I write emails saying that she should be fired. She is destroying our popularity with our viewers. And he wanted her fired essentially for telling the truth, right? He castigated her for telling the truth. Well, Tucker Carlson somewhat bent the knee to the popular narrative that was bogus, that uh, voter fraud played an important role in Donald Trump's defeat. Carolina, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I think that, you know, when they have an answer that they want to give us, they stick to it. Mm -hmm. As we saw with the whole cheap fakes thing, they seized on an opportunity. Whoa, I got my first super chat on Rumble. My God, Josh Randall, $10. Thank you so much. Hello, Luke. Just some donor love from your old friend. Blessings. Wow. Very excited to get my, my first super chat in a long, long time since I had my various YouTube channels demonetized and I just given up trying to keep up with YouTube's rules for monetization. I do keep up with YouTube's rules for staying on the platform. And I think I have so internalized them that uh, I think even in my daily speech, how could I not be affected by YouTube's rules that I've internalized to appear on their platform? So I'm sure even by... My private speech has become sanitized by YouTube's rules because I, I think that's good for me in that it, it presents a tremendous cognitive challenge to strive to say that which is true without breaking YouTube's rules for the platform. It's a challenge. It's like playing tennis with the net up versus playing tennis with the net down, right? Playing tennis with the net down is easier, but it, it's not as challenging. And I have internalized a lot of YouTube's rules. And so I, I try to frame things in a way that's more socially acceptable so that wherever I go, right, I have less fear of being violently and viciously confronted. In furtherance of what I regard as a noble ideal, I, I want to try to do good in the world, not just feel good. And so I try to present ideas that are palatable to the widest possible audience and to reduce the chances of unnecessarily giving people offense. But it does come at a cost, right? I, I, I convey less clarity, right? I, I'm less visceral. I get to be less authentic because I have so internalized uh, YouTube's rules. So I, I be, I've become the, the reflexive buffered uh, personality <laughs> that, uh, characterizes the Enlightenment left-wing liberal intellectual to some degree uh, by internalizing YouTube's rules for appropriate speech on its platform. To say any media that you see where the president appears in a negative light, that is potentially even the product of artificial intelligence, that, that she used deep fakes, and the White House never corrected that. Um, I think that they have seized on sort of an opportunity when the New York Post used that cover, which was zoomed in and misleading, to cast any video, including pool video. Yeah. I heard you talk about it earlier. This and uh, when we internalize this censorship, it affects how we think. Right, things that we're afraid to say out loud because they would just so dramatically operate against our own best interests could completely ruin our lives, not just ruin our lives, but ruin our, our families, damage our community. Right? By internalizing this censorship, it, it makes clear thinking more difficult. But everything comes with a trade off. This was, you know, the Juneteenth event was shot by the pool. Right. Um, just, that was, you know, somehow manipulated. It yeah. wasn't. I and they. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to wrap by saying uh, I would also point out they haven't released the medical records, only a summary. They haven't made the White House doctor available for interviews. All right, the Supreme uh, how Court cuts. handed Donald Trump a major victory by ruling a president has absolute immunity for official acts while allowing presumptive immunity for acts that could be challenged, but leaving that unclear. I think that it is a brilliant decision. It's a 6-3 decision. The left is going to go crazy. The majority of the court fears what has never happened. And the minority of the court fears what they have already seen happen. 
in the Trump presidency. The mass hysteria among the liberal media and Democrats is really quite overwrought. It's exaggerated vitriol. Um, this was a common sense, well-reasoned opinion. This court has said today that an American president is a king, an absolute F you to the founders. This court will never say no to him. The president should be allowed to perform his constitutional duties as president without fear that unscrupulous prosecutors will craft crimes out of thin air to arrest their political opponent. Trump said in the post, the historic decision by the Supreme Court should end all of crooked Joe Biden's witch hunts. So if you're a regular viewer of this show, you would not be vulnerable to this kind of hysteria over the U.S. Supreme Court ruling because you would understand, as I've repeatedly said on the show, that the president of the United States already has all the foreign policy power of King George III. Uh, more importantly, there's not a dramatic distinction between democracy and dictatorship, period. All right? There are ways that they're different, but all democracies contain considerable elements of dictatorship and or dictatorship contain elements of democracy, all right? There, there isn't this clear uh, black and white distinction. And it's one of the, the recurring themes on this show. And I, I refer to a 2010 paper in the Minnesota Law Review by two Yale University law professors, all right? Obviously, these guys know far more about the law than I do. And it states, if Americans know one thing about their system of government, it is that they live in a democracy and that other less fortunate people live in dictatorships. Dictatorships are what democracies are not. Dictatorships are the very opposite of representative government under a constitution. But this distinction between democracy and dictatorship is greatly overstated. We saw this during COVID, all these rights that we took for granted, such as uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, uh, freedom to go to school, to go to work, to go to worship in your church or synagogue or mosque were frequently taken away or, or diminished. And all rights right, can be taken away if the entity that is sovereign decides that we're in a state of emergency and the state of emergency doesn't even have to be real. Right? So a county health officer in California can basically shut down anything. Right. Every county in California, there are over 50 of them, have a health officer in charge, and they can shut down any public gathering, any business, any house of worship. They have that broad power. They can halt life as we know it if they believe there is a threat to the public health. So this power is already obviously there in our democracy and in any democracy. Right? You could not have a democracy that functions through all situations if there was not the ability for the democracy to turn into, at least temporarily, a dictatorship, right? So the reason for the taking away of rights and for the imposition of a dictatorship is always that we're in a state of emergency, and sometimes this state of emergency is vastly exaggerated. Sometimes it has no basis in reality, but if you can get the law enforcement and the you know, elites to go along with your decision, then you are sovereign, right? So Carl Schmitt said the ultimate goal of dictatorship is restoring the status quo, but dictatorship always lurks in the background. It's always waiting to emerge and to transform any existing political order. So it's not like there are only democracies and dictatorships, right? All forms of government contain elements of dictatorship, elements of democracy, elements of oligopoly, elements of socialism, elements of capitalism, right? So no matter how well-designed a constitutional system you might have, right, you will always have situations that will threaten the survival of your constitutional system. And someone who is sovereign will always be able to escape the confines of a constitutional system and make exceptions to it. So who is the sovereign? He who decides the state of exception. And claims of an emergency are the standard cause, the standard justification for creating dictatorships. So in 2009, President of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, placed the entire country under a state of emergency because of a potential swine flu epidemic. Right? This concentrated political power in his hands, right? he authorized his health secretary to inspect and seize any person or possession to set up checkpoints, enter any building or house, ignore 
procurement rules, break up public gatherings, close down entertainment venues, and, and that this situation would continue for as long as the emergency lasts. Right, so pretty much any person in charge when combating what they see as a grave threat to society right, can usually get approval for suspending the most basic of rights. Right? Latin America has a long history of using states of emergencies as ploys to return to authoritarianism. On the other hand, Nikita Khrushchev was commendably cautious regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis, but that cost him his job. Right? So there was a degree of democratic accountability that uh, cost Nikita Khrushchev his job as the leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, John Yu, a law professor at the University of California and author of the torture memos, argued that despite American objections to King George III, the President of the United States enjoys all the powers possessed by the English monarch at the time of the American Revolution with regard to the use of military force. So Carl Schmitt's notion of the sovereign, he decides the state of exception, right? The sovereign is whoever can successfully define something as a crisis and then do whatever he thinks necessary to meet the crisis. So the Democrats have been running for the last eight years with the theme that democracy is on the ballot. And so their own rhetoric has blinded them to the more complicated nature of reality. At the same time, Democrats have been running against Republicans with the idea that democracy on the ballot, the Democratic Party has consistently rigged its own primaries for presidential nomination in 2016, in favor of Hillary Clinton in 2020, in favor of Joe Biden, 2024 in favor of Joe Biden again, right? They have rigged their own primaries to create, uh, you know, their own aims. So Mo 